Joy has been on my mind lately. I just finished writing a book called Joy, Inc., about joy in a business context. You're forgiven if you want to run out of the room right now and order 10 copies, please do. <laughs> when I heard John Bacon talking this morning, he was describing a recipe for life. And in that mixing bowl, he talked about fear, and we all have it. He talked about passion, we all have it. I think if you pull enough of the ingredients of fear out of that mixing bowl and put enough of the ingredients of passion into it, you get to joy. I'll come back to this, but I will tell you this is what joy might look like. I can tell you this is what it looks like for me. But I'm not going to talk about joy in a business context today. I want to talk about joy in the context of a city, our city, joy in Detroit. How did I get here today? I came via a Detroit streetcar. Just after World War II, a young man with perhaps love on his mind and having returned to his hometown, noticed a girl on a streetcar, made eye contact with her, followed her off the streetcar and reminded her that they went to school together at St. Catharines here in Detroit. She remembered him. Well, actually, she didn't. She remembered him as his arch-rival nemesis, something for which he forgave her quite quickly because he had something different on his mind. And those two eventually became my parents. So my life began, I guess, in some simple way on a streetcar in downtown Detroit. And if you, like me, have parents that grew up in this town, you heard stories my parents grew up in this town during the Great Depression. You heard stories about the Depression. How many of you heard stories in your youth about the Depression? Right, it's why your parents did weird things like keep toilet paper rolls in the attic. <laughs> and say things like, you know, finish your dinner because there's children starving in China. Never quite knew how I was going to help that situation. But what I remember about their stories during the Great Depression was stories of community, of family, of people coming together, people living in boarding houses so they could support each other. I can remember still to this day my mother reflecting on the fact that she hated that I loved selling Morley's candies door to door when I was in school because it reminded, of her, reminded her of how her father had to sell cookies door to door just to make ends meet between jobs when he lived in downtown Detroit. The pride was there, the love was there. He did what it took to take care of his family. The stories also included Meet Me at the Clock. I have to say, when CompuWare reinstalled the current clock at downtown Detroit, it reminded me of all that time that my mother would say, that's how we met when we work down in Detroit, we'd tell each other, meet me at the clock. There were stories of the Detroit Tigers. Two of my mother's favorite players were Geringer and Greenberg. There are stories my father told when he was a youth during the Depression of how he and his best friend Mike climbed on a train at 14 years old in a freight car and rode it all the way to Chicago to see the Chicago World's Fair. He said he had a dollar in his pocket, and he managed to get to Chicago and back in a dollar. I don't even think you could do that with a skateboard we saw earlier. <laughs> there was a story of the little robin's nest outside their first Detroit apartment as they were raising their young family, and they watched the robin raise her family. And I think for them, they retold that story so many times because it reminded of them of the three boys they were raising. There was a story in 1951 when my father got a job offer from Alaska, and they were going to move the whole family up there, and then found out my mom was pregnant. And they decided to stay in Detroit. That was six years, years before I was born, so I suppose that's part of my story, too. Eventually, though, I started building my own stories. I was 11 years old when this happened. Those of you who are 
old like me will know that's Mickey Lolich and Bill Freehand in the seventh game of the World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals in 1968. And I became a dyed-in-the-wool baseball fan that year. I don't think there was a youth on my block up in Mount Clemens that didn't run out every summer morning grabbing a ball and a bat and running down to the field to play baseball. The Tigers are certainly part of our story. Sock it to them, Tigers. The other part of my youthful stories included childhood visits to Greenfield Village. This was a big deal for me. I don't even know why it was a big deal, but I used to go into that Menlo Park, New Jersey lab of Thomas Edison, the recreation that Henry Ford put there, and I would get goosebumps. Often coach young entrepreneurs and tell them, you want to find out what you should be doing in life, ask your inner eight-year-old. They know. This is what I saw. I saw stuff being made. That's what enlivened my life at an early age. And Henry Ford had created Greenfield Village to inspire people to great accomplishments of their own, especially the, the youth. And I can tell you it worked for me. Eventually, I started working on computers in 1971. I got hooked. I took my two passions in life and I put them together. I created the first baseball program on a computer. I typed the entire baseball register into a computer in 1971, which eventually won me a programming contest, which got me a job at the Macomb Intermediate School District as a programmer before I could drive. I should have stuck with that, right? The whole fantasy baseball thing. <laughs> but I just wanted to relive my youth. I just wanted to capture those magical moments on the baseball field. I wanted to experience that energy that I felt inside that Menlo Park, New Jersey lab of Thomas Edison that Henry Ford had so carefully had his team recraft in Dearborn, Michigan. So I became one of those pure Michigan kids with a dream. A dream that one day I wanted to have my own Menlo Park, New Jersey lab. One big wide open space where there was energy, there was collaboration, and yes, in fact, there was joy. And I got to that piece. This is our office in downtown Ann Arbor. But what was important for me was the passion, the energy, and the joy that was planted at my, in my mind by the people who made this town great. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the effect that had on the eight-year-old in me. So it's in our DNA, our terroir. Our joy is there. You can see it out in these booths out here. We are a place that knows how to make stuff. It's in the ground here. Terroir is a concept in, food that says that if the product of the ground is a product of the earth, the product of all the ingredients that make up the nutrients that go into those plants. We've got that here. I don't know why we have that here, but it's here, and we can't ever lose that. And I see it in the youthful spirit and energy of that place out there. I see it in the CSI team from Utica Community Schools. Where are you guys? You're out here somewhere, I know. There they are, back in the back. Go see those kids. They're doing amazing things. We can't ever lose this aspect of our joy, our DNA, and we're not losing it. We've got it here. It's alive, it's, it's well. We're seeing it here today. We have a city of joy. Let me tell you how joy translates for me and how I've reconnected it. I sponsor a child at Cornerstone Schools. If you've never been to Cornerstone Schools, you have to see it. This is where we're creating the next leaders of this city in places like Cornerstone. Samara White is, Samara White is one of the students that I sponsor there. And I got to go down in this field with her when she turned in the lineup for Be a Tigers for Kids Day. And you can't imagine what that feels like. If you've got any connection to the Tigers like I do, to stand on those lines, stand on that third baseline, look into the dugout and see my version of Geringer and Greenberg, see Cabrera, see Phil Fielder, see Verlander, see Scherzer, see one blue eye and one brown eye. You're that close. And see Jim Leland. 
and watch this youth walk up to that plate and hand in her version of joy to that manager. So I got to experience that with Smart. I got to return to the roots of my youth, the roots of my parents' youth, and get back to joy. And she sent me this, and she described joy in her words to me. It was so funny. She says, hello, Mr. Sheridan, how are you? Is everything all right with you and your business? I am fine, and school is going good, too. Hope to see you soon. She describes joy as happiness, laughter, fun all around for everyone. It's fun to reconnect to that kind of joy in our city. It's fun to see the new leaders develop, the new leaders get ready, because these are the kids that are going to lead the next generation as we have led this city to this date. So I want to leave you with what our work is together. Your job is to find your piece of Detroit. Some are able to build new buildings. Some are able to tear down buildings. Some are able to refurbish buildings. Some are able to start businesses and great bakeries. Some are able to plant fruits and vegetables in the ground that we can harvest later. Some are able to bring recyclable materials back for artwork. Others can change the life of a youth. You know what your work is. You need to go out and do it. And I want to leave you at last with these words from John Ruskin. Just remember, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think, as we lay stone upon stone, that a time is to come when these stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them. And that people will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, this our parents did for us. Thank you. <laughs>